scriptures talk about a blessedness that happens to a man whose delight is in the law of God. So as someone says, it says, but his delight is in the law of God. And doth he meditate day and night. He says that that man is like a tree planted by the rivers of water, whose leaves do not wither, when he bears fruit in every season. As you are about listening to this message, we believe that your life is going to be like that man planted by the rivers of water. Your leaves are forever going to bear. And we know that your, your season will not pass by. You will forever shine and you will forever bear fruit. We have a lot of content to share with you. So we would entreat you to subscribe to this channel as well as like us. Hit that notification bell to receive more updates from us because we know that whatever content here is going to set you on calls at every time. It's going to make you attain whatever stature that Christ wants you to attain. Thank you. And he answered and said to his father, Lo, this many years do I serve thee, neither transgress I any time at thy commandments. And yet... Thou never gavest me mercy. How could I have been so close to you? As far as I'm concerned, I fulfilled the condition that would have made me a recipient of your mercy. And as close as I was with you all these years, in spite of proximity, I never truly benefited from your mercy. You can be so close to the point of mercy, but if you do not fulfill, he made one mistake. This was his mistake. I have served you and I did not transgress. It's called self-righteousness. So he believed that I am deserving of your mercy by reason of my flawlessness. He marked his script, graded himself and demanded an award called mercy. The father is about to correct the young man now. Are we learning now? And yet, you never gave me a key that I may make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which had devoured thy living with harlots, and had killed for him. Look at how he's complicated. Are you seeing the detail? He's reminding the father, in case you have forgotten, let me help you understand the kind of person you are showing mercy to. He didn't say one who was feeding with the swine. He found the most dangerous part of the story and brought it before the father. Thou hast killed for him the fatted calf, 31. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. Look up, please. He said, It was meet that we should make merry and be glad for this thy brother was dead and is alive again. Remember his definition of death now? was lost and is found let me ask you a question how many of the man's sons were dead because we see that the results that follow those who die was on both the elder and the younger the only difference was that one acted out his rebellion and his anger by leaving. The other one remained in the house, but he was not broken. You need to understand this. When you understand this condition, you will know why so many people you pray for and say, Lord, are you blind? Are you not seeing this person? And yet it looks like they cannot. The condition for mercy is not service. No, he was serving in the house. The condition for mercy is not flawlessness. The young man did it. The moment the son satisfied that condition, I will arise and I will go to my father and I will say, Father, there is something I have recognized. My inadequacy. I have recognized my need for your influence. I have recognized that I cannot help myself. The father said, you've satisfied the condition. Stop. Believers, let me tell you, 
Herein lies the mystery behind God's supposed commitment to the life of others. And it looks like God seems to handpick a few people. And you are wondering, God, why are you investing your time, your attention, your resources on this person? And I'm there and it's as if you are passing me. And I'm a Christian. I, I'm a churchgoer. I love you. I love my pastor. And it looks like things are not working. I show you the system of administering mercy. When the strength of God comes and it finds strength, it will go back. The strength of God comes looking for brokenness. Do you know what brokenness is? Brokenness is a state of admittance of your inability to help yourself out of your personal resources that you are inadequate by default by reason of the fallen nature you don't have to wait to act it out and learn a lesson from your pain that by default you recognize that if at any point you are unassisted by heaven the result will always be disaster so you don't have to wait until you act and then surprise yourself it is a revelation that is ever before you that god is not just a matter of christianity god is not just a matter of church he is your life if at any point you are separate from his influence whatever decision that is made from that standpoint like the prodigal son like lot will always take you to disaster brokenness the mercy of god is ever searching for brokenness brokenness among preachers brokenness among business people brokenness among all kinds of people so you can find out that a young man can be smoking and drinking and lying down under a bridge and wondering but in his heart he's saying if there is a god i know i do not deserve to see your face suddenly jesus will leave a prayer warrior who is rolling in a room and come and appear before someone who is under a bridge and say i am jesus whom thou persecutest. If you do not know what God looks for in men to help men, we can continue shadow boxing in self-righteousness and hoping that we will find his help. Are we learning? In Daniel chapter 4, let me hurry for time. Daniel chapter 4. Let's look at verse 34. This was um, the story of Nebuchadnezzar. Remember, he had a dream about himself and the disaster that was going to come to him. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven and my understanding returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him that liveth forever. This was after seven years. Of becoming an animal remember he was so haughty he lifted himself and believed that he was God until he was turned to an animal for seven years this was the prayer of a repentant man watch brokenness even from a king are you ready and I praised and honored him that liveth forever whose dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom is from generation to generation next verse please and all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? At the same time, my reason returned unto me. And for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and brightness return unto me. And my counselors and my Lord sought unto me. And I was established in my kingdom. And excellent majesty was added to me. When he acknowledged that truly there was a God above him. Let me tell you this. Many, many believers are unable to receive of the mercy of God. Because there is something about the nature of man that would not admit that you are limited. There is something about the pride of men, especially in the presence of seeming results. It is very difficult to admit. I wish I had time, would have examined 
the story, one interesting story in the Bible, the story of Jonah. When you read chapter 1, the Bible tells us Jonah's encounter with the Lord and he was sent to Nineveh to warn them of their sins. The Bible says Jonah ran away. He ran away and straight into the belly of the fish, he caused people to lose their properties. When you go to verse 2, verse 2 in its entirety is the prayer of Jonah. Jonah was praying in the belly of the fish. You see brokenness in the belly of the fish too. Is that true? And Jonah prayed unto the Lord, his God, out of the fish's belly. Let's look at 2 and 3. I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell cried I and thou heardest my voice and when you read on you would see that Jonah continued to exp express brokenness and the moment brokenness was in place the fish could not eat Jonah again he brought him out verse 3 God comes to him chapter 3 he comes to him a second time and says Jonah now you go and warn the people that in 40 days I'm coming to destroy them and um, let me show you what happened. Are you ready now? Hmm. He arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days journey. Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey and cried and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overturned. You will see why Jonah ran away from God. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast. Shout brokenness. And proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them, even to the least of them. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Result, who can tell if God will turn and repent? And turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not. God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil. And that he had said he would do unto them. And he did it not. But Jonah justified. You, you see why Jonah ran away? There was something about God Jonah knew. He said, God, don't waste my time. I'm, I'm not ready to be insulted by these evil people only for you to now turn as though you were, I was a false prophet. I need punishment that validates that I'm a genuine prophet. And I know if this, if you find brokenness as evil as these people, only God knows how many of Jonah's relatives were victims of their wickedness. Chapter 4 and verse 1. Please go to verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was very angry. Why was he angry? Here's what he said. He's talking to God now. And he prayed unto God and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying? When I was yet in my country, therefore I fled before unto Tarshish. For I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repented thee of the evil. Jonah said, there is this information I know. In my dealing with you, I have learned that there is a weak spot. When you find broken people, individuals, families, churches, territories, even nations... You can turn against your prophet for the sake of brokenness. Jonah said, I know this about you. You sent me and now I'm looking like a liar. Hmm. Oh, the, what's that song? Overwhelming, never ending. Oh, he chases me down, fight till I'm found. Leave the 99. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. 
Till you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending You see that Jonah was a genuine prophet There was something about the nature of God he understood He said, God, you are sending me to these people, don't waste my time I rather run away I know you when you find brokenness nothing can stand your mercy so that it does not matter what my father did what I did here's how the Bible puts it if my people which are called by my name they will never see healing no just because I am merciful does not mean they will receive it there is a condition on their own part number one they shall humble themselves number two they shall pray number three they shall seek my face four turn from their wicked ways it says then will i hear from heaven and i will forgive their sins and i will heal their lands here is the balance believers hear me there are many people who believe that just because they are aware of the extent of god's love and benevolence that awareness will immediately impart mercy to them that is serious error there are many people who continue to jump and claim the mercy of god without a state of brokenness here is the balance that we must learn as powerful as the mercy of god is there is a state this is not only true for god to man it is also true from man to man how many people are so desperately deserving of mercy and yet you do not find brokenness in them how many workers to their bosses how many spouses to themselves how many leaders in church and business how many people are so deserving of mercy they hope that mercy will travel to come and meet them the bible says come before the throne of grace if you want to obtain mercy you have to take the step the prodigal son never met his father at home but the father never met him in the place of his mess they met somewhere in the place of his brokenness and obedience If we want to experience the mercy of God in our lives, we must understand that it is a broken and a contrite spirit. Let me wrap up with one more scripture. Luke 18, let's read from verse 9. Jesus began the discourse in Luke 18, teaching on the ministry of prayer. Remember, he spake a parable to the end that men ought always to pray and not to faint. And then he gives the parable of the unjust judge and the weak woman. Then when we get to verse 9, verse 9 now, he now talks about the danger of self-righteousness. Watch this carefully. He spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves. Are you there? that they were righteous and despised others so this was the morale of the parable he was teaching the danger of self-righteousness verse 10 two men went up to the temple to pray they were not doing evil it was prayer one a pharisee and the other a publican the pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself ready hear the prayer of the pharisee god I thank thee I am not as the other men which are number one extortioners unjust adulterers or even as this publican standing by my side he's talking to God now I fast twice in the week I give tithes of all that I possess and the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes to heaven who is speaking here jesus jesus is teaching something when jesus is talking you listen to him he is the wisdom of god he lifted his eyes to heaven he says but smote upon his breast saying god be merciful unto me a sinner i tell you this man went down to his house justified rather than the other for everyone that exalted himself 
shall be abased and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted still Luke chapter 18 let's go to verse 35 and it came to pass that as he was come nigh to Jericho a certain blind man according to Luke's account he calls him a blind man other synoptic accounts would give him the name blind Bartimeo and a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging and hearing the multitude pass by he asked what it meant follow carefully now and they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passed by and he cried saying Jesus thou son of David please finish it up for me he never said heal me because healing is an expression of mercy the entirety of the healing ministry is God's expression of mercy the man was not clear what exactly he needed but he knew that whatever it is that would be the cure for my weakness is under the department of God's mercy I told you that there are two expressions of mercy do not forget number one has to do with forgiveness and providing pardon is that true over one who is guilty an offender but that there is another expression of it that has to do with providing relief for one who is weak one who is beggarly and incapacitated every one of us here under the sound of my voice will require one or more of these expressions for the rest of your life hmm. Please, let's finish up the story. Look. He cried saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. The Bible says, and they which went before rebuked him that he should hold his peace. But he cried so much the more, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood. Are you seeing that by this singular act, Jesus confirmed that he was an expression of God because remember what the psalmist said a broken and a contrite heart oh God thou will not despise so if Jesus was truly the invisible image or the, the express image of the invisible God he should not see brokenness and pass so he stopped and commanded him to be brought to him when he was come near he asked him saying what will thou that I shall do unto thee? It looks like sarcasm. What should a blind man want? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. Here's what he said. Receive thy sight. Thy faith has saved you. Immediately he received his sight and followed him glorifying God and all the people when they saw it they gave praise to God mercy have you seen that everywhere you see the manifestation and the administration of God's mercy to individuals to nations to territories it always comes in response to brokenness therefore if you embrace brokenness as your default state now you understand what jesus was saying in his beatitudes when he said blessed are they that hunger and thirst he was not finding joy in their predicament he was he was trying to describe a state that if you are aware of your inadequacies you will always be filled it's a reward listen ask any man of God ask any businessman ask anyone who has experienced the grace and the glory of God in their lives their ministries and their endeavors if they are to be honest with you they may not even be able to articulate the basis of such investment of God's attention upon their lives. I'm giving you the theological explanation that there is something about their work with the Holy Ghost that has brought them to a perpetual state of brokenness. 
Brokenness is not self-condemnation. No, not at all. Brokenness is a state of awareness. Was this not what happened to Isaiah in chapter 6? When Isaiah beheld the glory of God, here's what he said. He said, woe is me for I am undone. He said, I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell amidst the people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. As a result, he was now ushered in to experience the mercy of God. A, one of the, the cherubs, the seraphs, had a live coal and he touched him and he says, your iniquity has been taken away from you. Believers, I don't know about you, but you see this man standing before you is a product of God's mercy. When I hear people brag and celebrate their achievements and everything, I stand back and I know that in all fairness, would I be honest with myself to credit the results on my life today to my performance connection? Is that true? Would I be honest? It's not just because I've read it in the Bible. I am aware of the limitation of my state sociologically, etc. You see that? Be careful. Lest when you build houses, Deuteronomy chapter 8, it was a warning. When everything is in place for you, that you will say, my power and the might of my hand that is the side effect of success that it is possible that when you succeed and the spotlight is on you it becomes embarrassing to credit the honor to another there is something about men and our each and desire to be celebrated why would i turn the attention of the world to me we say and now suddenly turn it to another Let me tell you this. There are men and women that will rise in these end times. You will add them up and see that as an equation they don't add up. You will look for where the wow factor is and not find it. It's hidden in the mercy. The mercy of God invested in their lives at the instance of their brokenness. You will see entrepreneurs rise that when you sit and talk with them, you will feel you are wasting your time. Yet you cannot deny the results that come from their lives. Because behind their frailties, there is the jealousy of a great God backing them. You will see this in preachers. You will see this in ordinary men. You will see this in mothers. You will see this in children. Listen to me. When you understand the entire theology of God's mercy, then you will now know how to be merciful to others. You will know what to look for also in administering mercy. So no one just blackmails you spiritually. Show mercy. No. I must, like God, find brokenness. If I do not see brokenness, there is no point communicating mercy I was glad when they said unto me the Bible says let us go to the house of the Lord you only find this in the house of God the wisdom of God that strengthens us now as a leader as a businessman you know what to find in administering mercy to your people perfection is exhausting and unnecessary search for brokenness among the many factors that you put as your basis for lifting people, if you do not find the component of brokenness, do not waste your time. A genuine, broken, and a contrite heart is what God looks for. Question. When we make the altar call, why do we oftentimes ask those who have admitted to stand up to come and stand before everyone and make that declaration? Does it really make any difference spiritually if they just sit back there and you say, well, here is this prayer. Go home and go and say it between you and God. Does it stop him from hearing? All that they do, that entire activity is just a way of helping them to establish their brokenness before God. So they come and stand. Are you ashamed of him to stand before men? You see why that coronation happened for Jesus? It was not just because he was Lord. Find out what happened to him. Philippians chapter 2 from verse 5 puts it very ex 
expressly. It says to permit this mind to be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then it says, verse 6, as we wrap up, it says, who being in the form of God, taught it not robbery to be equal with God. What happened? Watch this. He made himself of no reputation. Watch the protocol now. And took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. Here it is. And became obedient unto death. Now you understand our concept of death. First separation before cessation of living as far as the three-dimensional realm is concerned. Even the death on the cross. The death of the cross is how cursed people die. Wherefore, because that condition of brokenness was established, do you know that when Jesus walked upon the earth, he never called himself father? Jesus. He acknowledged perpetually that there was an authority above him, even as Jesus. He was comfortable being called son, Messiah, not father. I can of my own self do nothing as the word he did not think it was an embarrassment that even though his original name was and still remained the word and that the Bible says without him was not anything made that was made. Yet, he would say, I can of my own self do nothing. By reason of that brokenness, please back to Philippians chapter 2. It says, wherefore, God had so highly exalted him and given him an office that is above and greater than any other office. And then it says, at that name, every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. And every tongue should confess that that Jesus who was the Christ at his baptism has now become Lord. The office that was given to him is Lord. The absolute owner. So the psalmist by the spirit says the earth is the Lord's and his fullness thereof. He sits in that office not just as Christ but as Lord. This was the message of Peter on the day of Pentecost. Let it be known to you that that same Jesus whom you crucified has today been exalted as Lord and Christ. I show you a mystery. And a deep secret in the spirit. Behind the mysterious rising of many. Behind the investment of God's jealousy and power and grace. Upon seeming people who are seemingly not qualified. In all your diligence. In all your being productive. In all your contending for knowledge. In all your executions. Remember that there is a state of inadequacy in man that our very best is still short i believe in productivity i believe in diligence no visionary leader will use the subject of god's mercy to produce laziness out of his people no the subject of god's mercy if not understood will make it look like there is no need to be productive there is no need to submit yourself to learning and all of those things i told you that the mercy of god is a system of advantage that is based on the awareness that the best of man has been examined with time and it has still been found to fail yesterday i wrapped up with a scripture in john 21 the bible says that how peter said i go a fishing frustrated by the transition of jesus or the death of Jesus, he said, so I don't do two zero. Since I lost being a disciple, let me go back to what I was doing. I go a fishing and they said, we go with thee. The Bible says, and they went forth and entered into a ship immediately. And that night they caught, was Peter a good fisherman? Help me. Was his boat fine? Was his net well? Where do you find fish? So he was in the right location with the right tools, having the right mind, yet no results. There are times everything is right, yet no results. If you want to find fish, you should be at sea. If you really need to catch fish, you should have a functional net. 
There are times, oh businessman. There are times, oh man of God. There are times, oh family man, that from the standpoint of men's system, everything is in place. Yet you will surprisingly not catch fish. At that point, you do not need your skill again. Leave the boat and look for Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, little children, have you any catch? You, Peter would have been angry to say, I'm older than you. Little children, your age mates were killed already. So everybody who was older than Jesus was older than him by at least two years. He said, remember his, old, his age mates were killed? Now he's calling Peter who is married, little children. Peter said, I accept. I am a child because if I'm not a child, I should understand the dynamics that will be able to produce fish. And since I am that incapacitated, your verdict about me will not be taken for an insult. I accept. He was ready for fish. He said, cast your net to the right side. Since you passed that test and you're not insulted by my assessment of your weakness, cast your net to the right side. The Bible says he cast his net to the right side and all of a sudden he caught fish. Spare me a minute or two as we wrap up because someone came to church wondering, Lord, I love you. I've been around church. Remember the elder son. I've been around you. What is it about me that I've been in this church for five years and I may not have that much testimonies? A stranger comes in and before the sermon is already crying and he leaves back with his healing. He leaves back with his breakthrough. Two weeks after Wafbeck is returning with, with a buffet of testimonies. I show you the missing link. Could it be that you have not understood that the best of man is still limited? The mercy of God provides forgiveness, pardon for the guilty and for the sinner. But it provides a system of advantage to remedy for your inadequacies and remedy for your limitations by reason of wearing a mortal body. This is what makes him a high priest who has compassion. I define compassion as the ability to be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Jesus today is seated at the right hand as a man, not just as God. He went with his body, the man, Jesus. And he makes intercession because God does not pray. Only men pray. Prayer is for men. So Jesus can pray because he is still in heaven as a man. He makes intercession for us. The basis of his intercessory ministry is the fact that he has felt the reality of our humanity. There's no record of God being hungry. But when Jesus walked upon the earth, he was hungry one day. He looked at a tree that lured him. He came thinking green grass meant fruit or green leaves. And not finding any, he cursed the tree. The Bible did not hide the frustrations of Jesus. The Bible did not hide the limitations that even though God. One time he came to the temple and found men buying and selling. He whipped them. It's in your Bible. Jesus was angry. He wept at funerals. He was sad. The reality of that human nature. Now he captured that experience together and he's seated at the right hand. So he can tell the father, I know what it means to stand alone as a preacher from a family where nobody believes you. I know. I know what it means. Brothers and sisters, it is on the strength of the awareness of God's mercy that we are also strengthened to communicate mercy to others. The fortitude for mercy will not just come because you read it in scripture. You must have illumination and understanding. There is something intrinsic about the nature of man that should not surprise you again. The best of a man is still flawed. All it takes to reveal that flaw is time. Remember the story I gave us yesterday? The woman caught in adultery. The conviction started from the eldest, the one who had lived longest. No wonder our loved ones, the older they become, they become like children. All their anger of youthfulness just erodes with time. Because by the time they are 60, 70, 80, their life is full of stories and memories. And they can look at you over something and say, just go, it's all right.
My time is up. We're going to do two things. One, we're going to pray and ask the Lord to perpetually keep us in a state of brokenness. Brokenness means that you acknowledge that unassisted by the help of the Spirit, you are inadequate and your best is still short. And that when God finds brokenness, you are ready to be a bona fide recipient of his mercy. Please rise up on your feet or whatever position you find comfortable. Because please lend me two, three minutes, may I request, so that we pray. I don't know how you are going to talk to the Lord tonight, many following online. I'd like you to cry to your maker and my maker. Do not make the mistake of praying the prayer of the Pharisee. He came as an arrogant one to stand before God and was listing all his human credentials in hope that those credentials will find him a space in God's mercy. But there was one who came standing from a point of brokenness. Lift your voice in one minute. Cry to he that hears the prayers of broken people. It says, if I cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have heard me pray. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me. It leaves the ninety-nine. I couldn't earn it and I don't deserve it still you give yourself away oh the overwhelming never-ending reckless love of God make sure you are praying are you praying let it be from the depth of your heart I come before you with brokenness with the awareness that unassisted there is frailty in my nature that will not allow me bet the purposes of God accurately it is based on this understanding I come to you are you praying hello scriptures exhort us from the book of Proverbs it says my son attend to my sins incline thy ears to my words let them not depart from thy eyes and keep them in the midst of thee. As you have listened to this message, we believe that you are going to reap the blessings thereof if you attend to these words as well. That you will keep these words in the midst of your heart. That no matter the circumstance, your eyes are going to be fixed on these words. And as you have been blessed, we will tell you to share this message be an evangelist by sharing to others to be blessed and then subscribe to this channel for us because we have loads of videos we have loads of content that is going to make you blessed that is going to set you on course that is going to set you ablaze and don't forget to like for us thank you